so I have, I have 209 slides in 35 minutes, which is about 10 seconds per slide, so let's go. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, my talk is called Defragging Ruby. My name is Aaron Patterson. Um, I look a little bit different online than in person. This is what I look like online. Uh, <laughs> So if you don't recognize me, that is me. I'm on the, I'm on the Rails core team, and unfortunately, it's, it sounds like I may not be welcome here. I'm also on the Ruby core team. <laughs> in fact, I just heard this the, a little bit earlier. I, I might be in trouble. I want to tell you a little bit about Ruby 4. <laughs> None of your code will work. <laughs> <laughs> that is the future of Ruby 4. So f future of Ruby 4, actually, I want to talk to you a little bit about some deep scientific uh, computer science-y stuff. Um, you may know about, we are uh, talking about typing earlier. So I want to show you a demonstration of um, soft typing. So you, you may or may not know this, but this is what, this is what soft typing is. Yes, so that, that's soft typing, and now, now you can hear dynamic typing. Okay, this is some, this is some hard computer science stuff here. Now I want to, I want to demonstrate to you uh, static typing. Static typing goes like this. <laughs> and that is your computer science lesson for today. <laughs> I'm done, thank you. And, and I have automated the rest of this presentation, so I'll see you at the bar. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so I, I, work for, I work for a company called GitHub. You may have heard of them. They do Git hosting. Um, if you haven't heard of them, look them up on github.com. Uh, for, for work, I do a lot of um, GC programming. I'm a, I'm a GC programmer right now, so we're going to talk about GC topics. What this actually means is that I'm a... <laughs> I'm a heapster hacker. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, I love cats. I'm going to show off some of my cats. This is one of my cats. This is Choo Choo, or a SeaTac, we call her. This is Gorbachev. Uh, this is him hiding. He's an idiot. <laughs> He thinks he's hiding. Uh, so this is, this is Choo Choo again. She likes to sit on my desk and um, she also likes to get into boxes like this and her, <laughs> she just looks weird. <laughs> I, I really love her though because she sits there and looks like this and makes the exact same face that I do when I'm programming. <laughs> just, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> So, okay, we were talking about computer science stuff a little bit earlier. I, I've been doing some research on my own in my spare time. I want to show you after many, many years of research, uh, I've just been working nights and weekends to get this done. I was able to get the cat back into the bag. So, <laughs> this, is a, this is an important breakthrough for me. Um, I have many cat stickers, so if you want a sticker of my cat, please come talk to me later. Or if you have questions about this presentation, come talk to me. We can talk about Ruby 3 or whatever, uh, or Ruby 4 too. But <laughs> so I want to show you, before we get into the GC topics, I want to show you something that I built. Uh, and I, I made this graph. So this is, this is a graph I made. Along the x-axis is time, the y-axis is weight in grams. Uh, and you can see like it goes up and then comes back down. Uh, and I'm going to show you the apparatus with which I, I got this data. So it, it's, it's from this, this thing that I put together. That's, that's a scale. And up there we have a, it's a TI microprocessor similar to an Arduino. Uh, and then we also have a Raspberry Pi with a motion sensor built in. So we, we got a bathroom scale. Uh, the bathroom scale is, which I got for free, that's connected to this um, MSP430. It reads data off of the scale and then gives you back a TTY so you can get access to the data via TTY. Uh, the Raspberry Pi plugs into that and has a motion sensor, so it collects data from that, from the uh, TI chip. Uh, and has a motion sensor so it can detect when there's motion. So I've mounted the Raspberry Pi up at the top like that. So up there where the blue thing is, that's where the Raspberry Pi is. It has a motion sensor and it's pointing down the ground. Uh, below that, down here where this bar is, that is, a, that is the um, scale. That's the bathroom scale. And on top of the bathroom scale is where I have the litter box. And so whenever the cat comes along and has to do her business, she goes into the box. <laughs> And then I detect that motion, and I can, I can capture the weight. 
uh, and then she leaves the box like that, right? So if you take a look at this, if you take a look at this graph, you can see when when the cat came into the box, and then you can see when the cat leaves the box. And if you take the difference between these two lines here, you can detect how much was left over in the box after after the cat leaves, and that turns out to be approximately 100 grams. So. <laughs> So every, every project starts with a question, and my question was, how heavy is my cat's poop? And, <laughs> and should I clean the litter box? <laughs> now, unfortunately, that is talking about garbage collection, and I need to... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> This is, this is not a talk about garbage collection, this is a talk about garbage creation. So, uh, the talk format here, I'm gonna talk a bit about, I'm gonna use some Ruby code in this presentation. This is actually a very technical presentation and I need to move quickly. Uh, so we're gonna talk about, we have some Ruby code and some C code, though I've taken a lot of the C code and translated it into Ruby so it should be a bit easier to understand. But I'll try to point out when it's supposed to be C. Uh, we got a lot of binary numbers in here too and algorithms, but I've done my best to make sure that this presentation is accessible. So I'm gonna try and break down what you should pay attention to depending on your, your uh, level of familiarity. If you don't know much about uh, GC or memory management in Ruby, just pay attention to Ruby's memory format. I'm gonna describe the format that objects are stored in memory with a Ruby process. Just pay attention to how all the things relate to each other. And if you know about these, the, these shapes and relations already, then follow the C tricks that I'm gonna discuss. We're gonna talk about different C tricks that are used for managing, uh, managing objects in Ruby. And if you already know about these tricks, uh, pay attention to the compaction algorithms. We're going to talk about compacting, compacting objects in Ruby, uh, and especially pay attention to the algorithms that I'm going to be using in these slides, because there are downsides to the algorithm that I use in this presentation. Um, so we're going to dive deep into this, deep into uh, memory management in Ruby, and we're going to come back up and we're going to be repeating things over and over and over again because for me, it takes me a very long time to learn things and it's important that I repeat them. So I'll be doing that in this presentation today. So first we're gonna talk about object allocation and I'm gonna start from a very large scale. We'll start from the computer. Uh, this is what my computer looks like at home. I don't know about you. <laughs> so if we, if we zoom into the computer, you'll see inside the computer we have just a chunk of memory. So there's some memory inside the computer and a part of that memory is, is used by our Ruby process. So you can imagine that we have a Ruby program running inside of the computer's memory. And if we zoom into that, say we just have this, this box of Ruby's memory, inside there we have two different sections which I like to refer to as uh, the managed area and the heap area. And what I mean by the managed area is that on one side we have just Ruby objects and the other side we have stuff. And the reason, I'm, the reason I'm referring to it this way is because let's say we have an object like string, some, some kind of string, like string equals hello world. The way that's actually represented is that we have a Ruby object in the manage side and that points to the actual string contents over in this heap side. So the objects are managed by Ruby's garbage collector and when, the, when that object gets collected, it will also collect the, the uh, data that it has inside of the heap. So when I say managed, I'm really just talking about Ruby's objects, though everything in here is actually managed. So when I say managed, I mean managed by the GC. Uh, if we take a look at that managed side of the heap, so we have this managed page, inside of that we'll see we have different pages. So our, our managed area is actually composed of many pages, like this. Uh, and if we zoom in onto a page, we'll see that a page has slots, what we call a slot, uh, and a page is composed of many slots, and these slots can either be empty or not. They're either empty or full. So they'll, they'll either be free or they'll have some sort of object inside of them. So for example, let's say we have some Ruby code that looks like this, some kind of hash with key value pairs. Uh, one of those objects is gonna be the hash, and that hash is gonna point at each of the key value pairs inside of that page. So if we zoom into a slot, uh, a slot contains many bytes. In fact, one slot is 40 bytes, uh, and each byte is eight bits, 
And the reason that each byte is eight bits, well, I'm not going to say the, I'm not going to say that it was aliens, but it is aliens. That is why it's eight bits. Uh, so if we go all the way back out, so we've gone down to, we've gone all the way down from the computer down into bits. If we zoom back out and just recap, we have the memory, which is our entire system's memory. We have Ruby. Inside of that, we have managed and heap space. We have pages inside of the managed side. We have uh, slots inside of the pages. And inside of those slots, we have bytes and bits. So just to recap the way that we deal with memory in C, essentially, memory is dealt with in C as just an array. And this is important for the tricks that we're going to be doing with uh, Ruby's object system. So if we look at memory layout in C, it's just some list of bytes. And each byte has an address. So for example, we allocate some memory like this. We have some addresses. Uh, and each address is just an index into that array. So at each of those locations, we might actually store some data. And I like to think of this as just a neighborhood. Like we go to some address. If you have someone's address, you can go to that address and see what's actually there. So indexes are addresses. We can think of them as addresses. But what's interesting is that even if you have somebody's address, that doesn't mean you actually have to go there. So uh, I have Charlie's address. I don't know where he is. But I haven't gone over to his house yet, and I don't have to go to his house. It's not required that I visit it, even though he is in my address book. He's not actually in my address book. I'm sad about this. <laughs> so given this information, knowing that we can have an address without, without actually visiting the house, we can use some tricks. We can do some tricks with that. So let's discuss objects without allocations. We're going to represent objects in Ruby without actually doing any allocations. Now, we're Ruby programmers, uh, but MRI is written in C. So we have to have some way for Ruby objects to go in between the Ruby runtime and the C language. So we have to be able to pass these objects back and forth. And we, because of that, uh, we can do some tricks. The way, the way that we pass these objects back and forth is via their addresses. So uh, we know that Ruby objects are 40 bytes. And an interesting thing is that we actually align those objects at every 40 bytes. So Ruby objects are aligned at 40 bytes, which means that their address is divisible by 40. Now, if we know for a fact that a Ruby's address is divisible by 40, we can do something interesting. So when we pass an object from the Ruby runtime into the C runtime, we can look at the address and say, hey, if your address is divisible by 40, I'm going to go to your, go to your house and see what's there. So I will go look up that object. But if it's not divisible by 40, then I can do something else. So if we take a look at numbers divisible by 40 and print them out in binary, it'll look like this. So we have addresses. These are all multiples of 40. And you'll notice something interesting about the pattern. And that's that these last three bits are always, three, or are, are always 0. So if we know that the last three bits are always 0, we can actually add meaning to them. So we could change that code and say, OK, well, if the address is divisible by 0, we'll visit the house. If it's not divisible by 0, let's look at those last three bits and see what they are. Well, if the last bit is a 1, let's do something special, like maybe shift it to the right by 1. Now, in this manner, we can actually take integers and pass them back and forth between the Ruby, Ruby runtime and the C language without actually allocating any objects. So for example, let's say we want to take a, an integer in C and pass it into the Ruby runtime. What we can do here is, for example, we have the number 13. If we shift that to the left 1 and then we add a 1 bit to the very end of it, then we can return that into the Ruby runtime. And that's actually how we represent the number 13 in Ruby. Uh, and if we look at that in binary, we'll see, OK, we're, we're going to take 13, which is 1101. We shift it to the left one, and it's 11010. And then if we add another bit, it's 11011. So that's our binary representation of that, that number. So you can see, kind of see the pattern there. And we can actually do this encoding in the other direction as well. So let's say we want to pass the number 13 into, into C. What we do there is we say, OK, well, the address isn't divisible by 0, so let's do something special. Let's just shift that right to the right by 1. And you can see that this uh, binary number, that 1101, is back to the number 13. So we were able to encode and decode that number without actually accessing or without actually allocating any objects. And we can actually verify this in Ruby. If we take a look at the number 13 and call inspect on it, normally that just shows you the number 13. Now, if we get the inspect method from kernel, we can call that inspect method on the number 13 and get the original inspect, 
output, and you'll see that that's OX000, a bunch of zeros, and then 1B. And if we look at OX1B, that's actually 27, which is our encoded number, the one that we were looking for in C. So what we can learn from this is that object IDs are actually the address, the, the actual location in memory of your Ruby object. So also given this information, we can calculate what the, the maximum integer is that we can represent without doing any allocations. Uh, my system is a 64-bit machine, uh, which means it takes one bit for the sign, so we're down to 63 bits, and we have that special one-bit marker at the end uh, in order to indicate that it's an integer. So the maximum integer that we can, we can represent without doing any allocations is 1 to the 62 minus 1. So 64 minus 2, essentially. So we've gone down a bit deep here. Let's come back up a little bit. Stuff to remember, Ruby object addresses are divisible by 40. Now, if it's not divisible by 40, we can use those remaining bits to encode some, some data. So we can take those three bits and assign value to them. And what that, that technique is called is called tag pointers. So we're tagging that number with some sort of meaning in those binary digits. So the other thing to remember is that not all objects require allocations. So we saw here, for example, we could represent integers. We could take integers and pass them back and forth between the Ruby runtime and the C runtime without actually allocating anything. There are other objects in Ruby that can do the same thing, such as floats, true, false, and nil. And if you want to know all of those, all of those objects, as well as their encoding schemes, uh, go check out the object ID, object ID method in gc.c. And it'll show you a table with all of that information. So let's take a look at real object allocations now. Let's actually allocate an object. Now we saw earlier that we have a page and slots live inside of pages. Slots can be empty or not. Uh, so we'll have free spaces or non-free spaces. And these free spaces are kept inside of a list. So we actually keep a list of them and that list is called a free list. Now the GC keeps a pointer at the head of that free list. And what happens is every time we allocate an object, like let's say we do x equals object dot new, what it does is it asks the GC, give me a new object. And the GC says, okay, uh, I know where the next free thing is. It returns the next free, uh, free address as your new object and then pushes that pointer forward. So you always get that next thing. The, the next free is always pointing at the next object that's going to be allocated. So every time we allocate an object, it asks the GC, we get that next pointer and it's, it continues forward like this. So that's how we actually allocate objects. We're bumping this pointer forward in the list like this each time we ask for, ask for a new object. So our list of free slots is called a free list. So pretty easy to remember. Now what's interesting here is that we're not actually allocating in any memory in this case. We've already allocated that memory. We just have this block, this page, and each time we ask for a new Ruby object, it's just assigning that particular location to a Ruby object. We're putting an object in a certain place in the page. We've, we've actually not allocated any, any memory in this case. So uh, we're just filling up one of these free slots. The case where we would actually allocate memory is, let's say, for example, we ask the GC for a new, a new slot, but everything is full. There's no place to put a new object. What happens in this case is the garbage collector actually runs, and if there's no free slots after running the GC, it'll allocate a new page, fill that page with a new free list, put a pointer at the beginning of that free list, and then hand you back that new object. So this is actually our very first call to malloc. This is the first time we've actually asked the operating system for any, uh, any memory. And uh, the amount that we ask for, when we do ask for memory, we ask for this, this number. We ask for 16384 bytes. So one to the four, uh, 2 times 10 to the 14th, which is this number in binary. We actually ask for a little bit smaller than that. We ask for slightly smaller, I'm not gonna tell you the exact number because I can't do math on stage. Uh, <laughs> so maybe some of you can. Uh, but it, it doesn't ask for exactly 16384, it asks for a slightly smaller amount. And the reason is because when you ask uh, the operating system for say 10 bytes, it doesn't actually give you back 10 bytes. It gives you, or it doesn't actually allocate 10 bytes, it allocates 10 plus a little bit more for bookkeeping. So we have to keep track of, we have to take that bookkeeping into account because our goal is to allocate exactly 16K of, 16K of bytes. And I'm 
16 kibibytes. I sound bad saying that, but it's true. Okay, so our, our goal is to allocate that much memory, and the reason we want to allocate that much memory is because operating systems have uh, 4K pages, so we need something that's a uh, multiple of four. We want to fit on, on these uh, operating system pages. So one OS page is 4K. We want to consume about 4K. We don't want to consume more than, or we want to consume four pages, and we don't want to consume more. So we have to take that into account. So this is extremely confusing nomenclature, one kilobyte versus one kibibyte. And the reason I'm being specific about this is because these binary numbers are extremely important to the tricks that we're doing here today. So uh, one kilobyte is actually 1,000 bytes, and you'll see that in binary. Uh, one kilobyte, or one kibibyte is uh, 1024 bytes, and you can see in binary that's a much nicer number. We want to deal with that nicer number. Now, in real life, People refer to 1024 and 1000 both as kilobytes. Uh, and as a programmer, this kind of annoys me. But as somebody who comes from a place that uses the imperial system, I'm OK with it. Uh, <laughs> So, as I said, this is our very first call to malloc, and we're actually doing what's called an aligned malloc. So, what is aligned? When we normally ask the operating system for some memory, we get back this new, this new area of memory with some addresses. Uh, now, let's say we ask the operating system, unfortunately, these addresses can start anywhere. They can start at any ran oh my god. I, oh my god, okay, let's move faster. So an align malloc, let's say we're going to do an align malloc on 10, uh, which means that our addresses are going to be a multiple of 10. So what we do is we say we want an aligned malloc that's a multiple of 16384, right? What happens is our page is uh, aligned at 16384, and the size is also 16384, which means that that first address is divisible by that number, but there are no addresses inside that space which are a multiple of that number. Sorry for all the math. I told you this was technical. <laughs> so this ensures that Ruby pages are aligned with OS pages. All right? Are we all on the same page? Okay, I only, have, I only have 10 minutes, we have to move, we have to move, okay. So, <laughs> let's do some address tricks here. Uh, and exactly the same example as our 40 bytes, except here we're looking at multiples of 16384. If we look at that, you'll see that only these upper bits change. We have these lower bits, which are all zero. Those are always zero. So if we look at these numbers in binary, we can see we have some sort of encoding going on. And if we break down the address, we'll see that these upper bits represent the page that the object is on, where the lower ones actually represent the object itself. So when the objects change on the page, only those lower, those lower bits will change. When the pages change, those upper bits will change. So we have address encoding, and we can actually go a step further and say, well, those, those three bits actually stay zero if it's a Ruby object, but if it's not a Ruby object, if we're using a tag pointer, then it's going to be something else. So a Ruby object will never change those bottom three bits, only those middle bits will change, and when we change pages, those upper bits will change. So we have to do page alignment. We're doing page alignment and object alignment. If you remember, I said we had to do some trick with that number 40. And you may notice 16384 is not divisible by 40. So what we have to do is we have a page which is this size. The beginning of it is 16384. Where we actually place that Ruby object has to be a little bit further down the page. We have to find the very first number that is divisible by 40 inside the page. So that's going to be our first slot. And what that means is sometimes, so sometimes when we ask the operating system for this page, we get a number that's divisible by 16384 and divisible by 40, which means we can start at the very beginning of the, that page. And what this means, in, this is incredibly annoying, but what it means is that pages will hold either 407 or 408 objects, right? So we can actually use this information to find the page for the object. If we perform some math on the object ID, we know that the object ID is the address. So we can see that X and Y are actually allocated on the same page. Those are the page addresses we've calculated there. So this is useful for heap dumps. If you use object space .dump all, uh, you'll see the output looks like this. Object space dump all is in the standard library, which I've heard is trash. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you should go check this thing out, and it'll, it'll give you the address of the objects, and you can calculate the pages where those objects live. So here's the code for calculating that. Uh, now, I want to talk a little, yes, I'm going to go past this, because we don't have freaking time, apparently. 
So let's talk about fragmentation and locality. Fragmentation is how, how spread out the objects are. Do we have spaces between them, free slots? If we can move those objects together, we can improve the locality and decrease the fragmentation. So as we said, we have slots. Our slots contain objects. Locality is how close together the objects are. Fragmentation is how much space is in between those objects. So let's talk about GC compaction, 70 slides in five minutes. Let's do this. What is compaction? Well, we can visualize some uh, GC algorithms like this. On the left, we have a mark and sweep algorithm. That's the one we normally use in MRI today. This is, on the right, this is a mark compact algorithm, which is the uh, stuff I've been hacking on. And you can see what the difference is here. You'll see the mark sweep algorithm is leaving holes in the heap where the mark compact one, every once in a while, you can see it's compacting those objects to one side. Uh, another way to look at it is if we have this page uh, with, filled with slots, we move those around, we rearrange them such that the free slots are in one area and the objects are in another area. So why compact? The reason we're looking into this is to reduce memory usage. Uh, for example, we want to do compaction before we fork processes so it gives us copy on write performance. Uh, possible speed increases, but not necessarily guaranteed. If we can get better, uh, oh my god, <laughs> better locality, then we'll, we can possibly increase the speed. Compaction has two steps, compression and reference updating. Uh, compaction is when we take all the objects and move them around like this, but you can see clearly that that screws up the references that we have inside the page. And this is bad because we know that if we have this memory layout and we go to somebody's address, if the address is bad, we may go there and instead of finding a nice friendly family, we find a scary clown. And in, <laughs> in that case, we get a segmentation fault. So the compaction algorithm that I'm using is called a two-finger compaction two-finger compactor, and the way this works is we have two fingers, one on either side of the heap. The one is called the free pointer, the other one is called the scan pointer. The free pointer scans until it can find a free slot, the scan pointer scans until it finds an object, and then it swaps the two and leaves a forwarding address. So in this case, they don't have to go anywhere. We swap the two, and in the old location, we leave a forwarding address. So any objects that we're referring here, they now need to go to one. And we repeat this process, scanning forward until we find an object, well, scanning backwards until we find an object and swapping the two, leaving a forwarding address. And we continue repeating this, repeating this procedure until both fingers have met and the compaction algorithm is complete. So everything is put together, everything is uh, sorted in this, this uh, scheme. So next thing we have to do is actually update references. If we have objects pointing at each other like this, after everything is compacted, we actually need to update those addresses. So we scan through the heap again, looking for objects that have, ad that have references, and updating those references to point to their the new locations. So we scan through, and then we're done with everything. I think I only have like a minute, Jesus. All right, so let's talk about compaction challenges. Why hasn't this been done yet? We're doing new development on this at GitHub. We're using it in production today. Uh, why hasn't it been done yet? The reason it hasn't been done is because it's freaking hard. Uh, <laughs> we have to fix Ruby internals, for example. Here is an example of some Ruby internals where I have to agree reassigning constants is very stupid, but it's one thing that you can do. In this particular case, we have a constant that's, that's set to a global in C. Now, what happens is, I can actually set that constant to nil, and if I do a GC after that and do a file.join, it'll explode. We'll get a segv out of that because we're referring to, refer, referring to a C global, and I found this with our, with our compactor. Now, if you compare this to JRuby, it doesn't blow up. You get a stupid error, but at least you didn't get a segv. Uh, so we had to fix Ruby internals to deal with stuff like this. We also have to fix C extensions. This is a similar error in the message pack gem where it's, it's assigning a Ruby object to a C global and we happen to move that global. Another example here, if we run this, set default factory to nil using our favorite feature of setting constants, uh, we'll get a segmentation fault. So we have to also be able to find references to update. So for example, symbols. In Ruby, symbols are actually stored in a global symbol table, just some hash. And the key of the hash is the actual address of that symbol and the value is the string value of the symbol. 
Uh, we also have to update instance variables on special objects. So typically, if you take these two examples, uh, instance variables on the foo, the foo object are actually stored inside that 40 bits. We have an area to store those instance variables, whereas this array subclass does not have that luxury. An array is a special object, and it can't store those on the object. So those instance variables are stored on the object. These are actually stored inside of a global table. And we can see the difference between these if we run some uh, benchmarks. So you can see clearly here, if you access a, accessing an IVAR on a subclass of an array is actually much slower than accessing an IVAR on a normal uh, Ruby object. That global table looks like this where we have uh, the object address, so that would be the address of our array subclass, and then it points at a hash which contains the instance variables for those. So, Jesus, I, all right, whatever. <laughs> We have a break coming up, <laughs> screw it. <laughs> so what can and can't move? Things that depend on the address prevent them from moving. So things, if you deal with object ID, we said that that was a memory location. If you depend on that, that means we can't move it. Hash keys, the default hashing algorithm uses the address of the object for hashing, so we can't move those. Literals, so for example, if we have this thing, the string equals hello world, that's a literal in the, in the code. Uh, the way Ruby actually compiles that down, it turns that string into an object, allocates it on the heap, and the bytecode in here, if we di disassemble the bytecode, that string is actually stored inside the bytecode. The address of that string is stored inside the bytecode, so we can't move that. So we also have to deal with C extensions, which we should talk about later at the break. But basically, I came up with a, what do they, what do they say in, uh, in academic papers? Um, uh, nifty or clever solution for dealing with these, which is essentially we do a GC. Whenever somebody calls RBGC mark in a C extension, we ensure that that object can't move. So we have two marking functions, a public marking function which pins your objects and an internal one that doesn't. So our top level compaction steps are four passes to the heap. We have to mark the heap to prevent those C objects from moving, compact the heap, update references, and set forwarding pointers. So I want to show a few graphs of the results from our compactor and then we'll be done with this. Uh, this is an example from a Rails heap. This is the code to actually get the heap from a Rails application. This is what it looks like before compaction. This is what it looks like after compaction. Uh, red slots are play objects that can't move. Green are movable. White is free space. So this is before compaction, 528 of the pages could be allocated on. After is 167. This is good but not great. We can improve it. Uh, number of pages should have decreased, but it didn't. So ideally, these would have been moved over there, and these pages would have gone away. So this is what it looks like for our application. <laughs> this is the heap for our application. So unfortunately, this is bad news. We don't actually want to have all that white space. We want to compact all of that. But the good news is that we have a way to deal with this. It just takes more work, and I'm going to be working on this more. The next steps are dealing with object IDs. Uh, we are going to store those in a hash table. I'm doing that today, actually. Uh, using it, use in production, we load it like this, load our Rails app, compact the, compact the heap, and then fork our child process workers. Then we're going to push this upstream along with future optimizations, such as dealing with strings and symbol hash keys and fixing literal references. So to wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about Rails. We've done Ruby and C. Let's do a little Rails, just a little Rails. Ruby's heap has many pages. A page has many slots. Slots can be empty or full. You can debug your heap with uh, object space. And GC compaction brings all of us closer together. And finally, all this technology, all this science, I think it's genius that we can use all this hard work together to measure how much your cat poops. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Aaron. We actually have time for two questions. Two questions. One, two. <laughs> you can ask about my keyboard, too, or maybe later. We can talk about that. Thank you for your talk. Yes. Yeah, it was wonderful, as always. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, right now, without these uh, optimizations, we, 
well, someone, someone thinks, but uh, we does not really uh, take into account the memory, um, is it located or not, uh, it only comes from the, when you have issues on the servers on reproduction and we have uh, profiling and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right now in current code, in current Ruby, uh, what can we do to uh, reduce the um, numbers of allocated memory? Let's put it. Some Reduce the amount of allocated memory? Uh, uh, be, yeah. And rails, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quit allocating so much? <laughs> uh, no, the, I, know, I realize that is a tautology. Um, you can, if, I think some experiments have shown that if you GC more during boot time, you can uh, actually get less fragmentation. So if you're using a forking server like Unicorn, you can improve copy and write performance in that way. Uh, but as far as actually allocating less, um, it's really up to your application. I can't, I can't tell you necessarily. Um, but I can tell you upgrade to Ruby 2.4. It'll help a lot with allocations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Next one. So this is a silly one. I have a cat, I have scales, and I have also MSP 430. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah, and Raspberry Pi, please open source your solution. Uh, absolutely, I will push it up to GitHub. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. They found each other. Well, let's take one serious <laughs> The other more. person. <laughs> uh, thank you, Aaron, for the puns and jokes. Yes, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and mm, I have a question about GRuby, and actually, uh, um, after Charles' talk, yes. uh, do you think the optimization of, of MRI is still worth it? Maybe we should <laughs> all move to JRuby and stop Ooh. this page stuff. You, you know I'm on, the, I'm on the Ruby core team, come on! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, what, uh, overall, what, what's, uh, what are your thoughts about oh. JRuby at MRI? So I, I definitely think it's I definitely think it's worthwhile. Um, we use like we use MRI a lot at work, and I don't think that we'll be switching to JRuby anytime soon. But that's mainly due to uh, requirements of our applications at work. So it's definitely worth it for us. Um, I mean, I don't know about the rest of the world in general. I mean, theoretically, we would be giving up on JRuby and going all to Truffle. <laughs> if if we're gonna go, I mean, if we're if we're gonna go the route of the best like best um, theoretic uh, Ruby runtime, probably Truffle is the place to go. But I mean, yeah, yeah it's it's worth it for us. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, I want to uh, tell you that uh, while we have this garbage collector and uh, cat litter box litter box jokes, we need them right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Very much. You're yeah. welcome. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Aaron. Find right. me later.